Thank you so much for the invitation. Really, I've taken as my task to speak to the public. I, one could say that it's the opposite of this science where we, you have the lead in generating new knowledge. I formed, uh, together with son and daughter-in-law, Gapminder Foundation to improve the quality of public education about science and facts, and especially about the world. And we have done that by trying to simplify really simplify how the world is today and how it's changing. Just look. This is the world and we are seven billion people. Each doll here is one billion. Where do they live? Where do these seven billion live? Well, one billion live in the Americas, one lives in Europe, one in Africa, and one, two, three, four in Asia. That's the main message, isn't it? It's an Asian world. And, and, and it's dominating. Now, these are very rounded numbers, but they're actually more or less correct. The difference is that, that the, the European is actually 0.7 billion. So if anything is exaggerated here, it's the number of people in Europe. And then I've added Europe all the way to Vladivostok here, you know, and to Greenland to, to sort of try to get as much Europe as possible. <laughs> huh? And what will, happen, what will happen in the next 50 years, we know fairly well. There is no discipline who is as good as foreseeing the future as the demographers. United Nations Population Division, in their 40 years forecast, have never been more than 6 to 10% wrong since 1950. We know fairly well how many we will be. There will be 2 billion more. Where will they live? Well, 1 billion will be in Africa, and 1 billion will be in Asia. See, Africa will double its population in the next 40 years. And, and, and Asia will increase with 25%. Boring Europe, nothing happened. America, almost nothing happens. Now, we are not used to see America and Europe as one unit. So if I split America into Latin America and North America, and I split Europe into European Union and the other parts of Europe, I get what's often referred to as Western world. It's enormously difficult to draw this line. As you see, most of Greece ended up inside here. And <laughs> it always worked, that cruel joke, you know. <laughs> this is an ethnic concept. I strongly advise not to use Western world in teaching, since we don't have any definition of it. Truth always wins. Eh? And Western world has no truth. Christian, rich Christian in genes, someone says. That's the definition of, 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 of but they're not so Christian any longer. So, uh, this concept is very strange, but we still have it. But look what it will be. In just, in just about 40 years from now, it will be one ninth of the world population. To my great surprise, what I mainly do is that I lecture at the highest level in the corporate sector. And it was almost as an embarrassment for me, coming from the Department of Public Health, that it was the CEOs of major companies that nominated me to that position in Time magazine. Because those who understand the world most, I've noticed, is the CEOs of the major companies. Because they see where their customers are. Atlantic is no longer the center of the world. Neither is it the Pacific, it's the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean will be a major uniting uh, force in, in, uh, in, in the future world. And what we can see here uh, is that we know about the future population growth. We used to call this developing world. I've tried to explain that there is not two types of countries in the world, but it seems hopeless. Therefore, I now suggest a new term for the developing world. I've been thinking a lot, and I launch it here today. I suggest we call it the world. <laughs> That's where all people live. It is the world indeed. Huh? And, and the future is not whether this part of the world will catch up with those who had a lucky start in science, economy, and social development. Huh? But whether those who had a lucky start will be able to integrate in the bigger world. That is the task. If the task is for those who consider themselves ethnic West to be proud of being just the foundation of the modern world with its strong institution, this being one of them, the academy. Now, 
This is another way of showing the world population. It grew very, very slow. 1600, 1800, almost nothing happened, and then this fantastic rise of population. When I went to school, we were three billions, and now we are seven billions. And looking at that, many said, oh, it will continue like this. But it will not. Because if you look at this line, from here to here, it's not exponential. It's absolutely linear. We are adding 1 billion 13 to 14 years intervals. And a linear increase means a falling growth rate. It means that the percent growth is falling rapidly. And what in fact is about to happen is something completely different. I used to focus that by showing not how many people we are, because that confused the mind. It's how many children we are in the world, below 15. When I was born, we were much less than 1 billion. And then it increased to 2,000 to 2 billion children in the world. And what will it be in the future? And mind you, <clears throat> one of these lines are correct. I put the quiz, quiz to the academy here. Eh? Will it continue in the same way to year 2,100 and be 4 billion children in the world? Will it uh, increase a little slower and be 3? Will it stop growing and be 2? Or will it start to decrease? Now, I won't be cruel that we didn't bring any voting years here, but think a little. I let this hang. I let this hang. What do you think is happening with the number of children in the world? Huh? Because I can show it to you here. This is my favorite graph. It's the software we developed in Gapminder where we display every country as a bubble. <clears throat> the size of the bubble is the population. So this obviously is China, the biggest bubble. And this is smaller, it's India. This is 1961. And what we display here is countries as colors. You can see from there the region. It marks the region where they are situated. Here is the length of life. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. China was low because this was the year after the big leap that caused an enormous decline in health in China. And all these countries over here, they had large families. Here I show babies per woman. It's the two basic elements of families. How many children you have, how long you live. Uh, and, uh, and you can see that most of the countries of the world had almost five to six to eight children, and they lived less than 55 years. This was rightly called the developing world, and that was called the Western world, because it was a dichotomy. You don't have to have a degree in science to see that there are two types of countries. There are just two clusters. Eh? Anyone who watched football see that there are two teams there eh? in different corners. And there were very, very few in-betweens, very few in-betweens. And what has happened now? What has happened during these last 50 years? Have the world changed? Yes, indeed it has. Indeed it has. Here we go. Look at China. They improve their health after that. And very soon they start family planning and they are coming down here and they get fewer and fewer children. And India tries to follow. Latin America is follow. They don't care about the Pope. Here comes the Arab countries, the green Arab countries. They also look at Iran. They're speeding up to this. This is the HIV epidemic in Africa. But most of the rest of the world gathers up in the corner with long life and small family. It's a new world. The change has already happened in front of us. Look what an enormous difference it is. If we go all the way back, we were there in 1800. And then some countries started to improve there, and we got this dichotomy in the world. It was never as big as it was here. That was the end of colonialism, the start of independence for almost all countries. And independence is a good thing. Look here, how oh, they got healthy, and they got smaller family, and they are up here. And it's quite interesting to see how fast it, it has gone. Very few people would be aware that, for instance, if we compare Sweden up there with uh, Iran, sorry, Iran is there, eh? down there, 1964. Today, today we have, we have a situation where Iran has fewer children per woman than Sweden. There is no relation with main religion in country and number of children any longer. It's gone. And if we, if we really look at the countries of the world, we can see that, that 
the average number of children per, per woman today is about 2.4. This is the average of the world. And the reason of that is, yes, indeed, countries like Afghanistan and Congo. How can I know them by heart? Because how many faces do you remember? How many cell phone numbers do you remember? Number is a bloody intermediate. It's very difficult to remember. We have found that when we put back data into graphics and we let time be represented by movement, we get a very broad understanding, very broad understanding of the pattern. And, 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 and the idea of a developing world is almost like a joke. It doesn't have any intellectual content here. Because what is this? What am I showing here? Is this a theoretical statistic? Yeah, yeah, right, baby, per woman here. It's fertility rate, total fertility rate. Huh? It's the bedroom. This is what the young couple whisper into each other's ear. If they say, we shall have two children, we want them to have shoes, they shall go to school, they should have bicycles, we should be able to go to the beach. We have a modern world. We have what's called pillow talk. It's a wonderful expression in American English. <laughs> huh? When the young couple have pillow talk, it has been proven that in all culture they are equally good at picking the pill or the condom under the pillow. There's no problem. Everyone can do it. Huh? And what is this? This is the bathroom and the kitchen. We know in public health, but before all pharmacology, we need soap and water in the bathroom and food on the kitchen table. If you have that regularly, you live 65 years. And <coughs> many attribute the Chinese... Uh, government and parties, one-child policy as a reason for this. But look, it's just 1.6. As far as I know, the Communist Party of China never ruled in Japan, and they have 1.4. <laughs> Neither did they rule in Taiwan, which is 1.1. And neither, or just very recently in Hong Kong, the only place where we have one-child families today. It's something much stronger than politics that's happening in the bedrooms. And, and, and little are we aware that we have in successful Asia so very, very low fertility rates today. And I found out I like anthropology quite a lot. In fact, my best article is molecular anthropology, a methodological approach. And, and, and to understand this, I've been lecturing in Hong Kong. I was at the big investment co uh, conference, and at the dinner I was lucky to sit beside one of the new, young, successful bankers in Hong Kong. She was less than 40 years old. And we came to talk about private things during the dinner, and at the end I asked her, but don't you think about children? You are not married, you're just working hard, you are very successful. Don't you think about children? Yes, she said. I think about children all the time. It's the idea of a husband I can't stand. <laughs> and this really shows that <clears throat> in, Asia, <clears throat> in Asia, we have seen an enormous social progress, not the least in China. We've seen an enormous economic progress now. But gender equity is the most toughest thing to come. Gender equity, you know introduce acceptance and legal right to divorce and you get more marriages. Yeah. You, have to, you have to change it. So this is of very importance for global demographics now, that we have so many which, which are low here. Sweden is by no means a low fertility country. Sweden is, uh, Sweden is there. You see? See how many countries in the world that has less children per woman. The size of the bubble represents the population and they are on top of each other there. So, so what, what is then the world look like? Well, I like photos also. This is the Catholic family in Mexico building their home. It's just like when I grew up in the 50s in Sweden. Father was building the home physically. Huh? It's the Muslims in Bangladesh acquired a rickshaw. They have decided to work hard to get a better life for their young daughters. They should be able to study. It's the Hindus in India, in Kerala here. It's the, the, the Buddhists in Vietnam on a two-wheeler already. This is the world. The most common family size in the world is two-child families. Eh? And, and, and the right answer here is two. The number of children in the world has stopped growing. It's the most hidden important fact in the world. I call it peak child. Because we are still debating peak oil. You know? 
but we are more, much more solid data on peak child. It's not for sure. Projections in demography is not for sure. It is a possibility that you get gender equity into Asia and poverty remains in Africa. Then you will have a growth of the number of children. But this poverty is fast alleviated in Africa and gender inequity maintains itself in Asia. Then you will get no more children in the world. So how come the world population is growing? It will grow like this. It will only, it's only possible to stabilize on 9 to 10 billion by the end of this century. But the fast population growth will be over in 40 years from now. There may be a continuous growth, but the fast growth will be over. And why doesn't it stop now when we already have two child families? That's why I have developed these analog teaching tools. They are quite good. They're called building blocks. My grandkids love them. So let each one of these represent one billion people. There's two billion children in the world, one, two. There are two billion, almost, between 15 and 30. And there is one billion between 30 and 45, one billion between 45 and 60, and then it's my group, 60 plus. Eh? We are here on top. This is the population pyramid of the world today. You have to make it simple to show the most important. Why are these people missing? Can you see there are three billion missing here? They are not missing because they died. They never existed. Because there were so much fewer born before 1980. And I was born here in 48. Then we were much fewer born. That means that as long as there were much more than two children per woman, it kept increasing. Now the number of children will not increase. Why will then the population grow? Well, it's very easy to show. It's almost embarrassingly to show this in the Academy of Science. But you know the fact? The old will die. The rest, they will grow 15 years older and they get 2 billion children. The old die, the rest grow older and they get 2 billion children. And the old will die, the rest grow, it's quite monotonous, isn't it? They grow older, they get 2 billion children. Then it stops growing. Then the old will die, the rest grow older, they get 2 billion children. The old will die, eh? they grow older, they get to nothing happens. If you want to check this at home, you have building blocks with your grandkids or kids, you can control it, you know. You can do it with Lego, you can even do it with toilet paper rolls, you know. This is, this is the most misunderstood. I have environmental lists. Students who say we have to stop at 7 billion people. We can be no more people in this world. They want to kill these people. It's impossible. We can't stop now. Even if we get two child families overnight in the world eh, and, and in all places of the world, we'll still add this. We have 2.4 now. And, and, and we, we will end up with 9 to 10 billion. Then it may start to shrink. Those who think that manipulation with population can solve environmental problems, they haven't understood the seriousness of the environmental problem. Because it's such a long-term thing to do this. Yeah? It's, it's, it's really, it's really uh, something completely different. Look at this. We cut the chessboard in half to show what we call the, 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 the family mat. This is the number of birth per woman, 65432. This woman up there, she gets two children, they both survive. Because here is the number of death per woman. Minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. The old balance. Back in history, 200, 300, 400 years ago, still in the rainforest today, you get six children, but four dies before they grow up to get children themselves. And you only have two children who replace their two parents. That's a balance. But I, I protest when I hear people say that the population in the rainforest live in ecological balance with nature. This is wrong. They die in ecological balance with nature. They indeed have an amazing knowledge about nature. And their human rights absolutely need to be respected. But don't be naive and romantic. They have enormously high death rates. This is what the entire world had, 1800. Look, the entire world was here in 1800. And then this remarkable improvement on the world average led us up to there in 1970. Then we had... Five children per woman and one child who died. Two parents were replaced by four children. 
doubling population in each decade, and, and uh, um, the population bomb was written by Paul Ehrlich. It was the point where world population was growing at its fastest. And it was just, just because, because had the world population followed this line, look, has it gone from 5 minus 3, 4 minus 2, 3 minus 1 to here, we would still be 1 billion people. But the people just wanted a little margin to see that their kids really survived. And when they saw that, this is what the world population did. I don't think we can criticize ourselves for that. We didn't walk here. Had we gone like this, we would be one billion still. Just because of that little small deviation, we, we became 10 times as many. It's quite interesting to work on this mathematically, you know, because it gives the wrong, and we are there now. But of course, you saw, Afghanistan is still there. But isn't it amazing that the two worst of countries in the world, Afghanistan and Congo, today correspond to the world average in 1970? And then I have students who still come and ask me, is the world getting better? Well, it has never improved as fast as during my lifetime. It's an absolutely amazing speed of improvement. But it doesn't mean that we are going right into paradise. It means that we change all the old problems for the new problems. And the main environmental problem still today is that one to two billion people in the world daily drink their neighbor's lukewarm feces with polluted water. But the main environmental challenge for the future, without no doubt for me, is the climate threat. But that's not now. It's in the future. Now we still have deep poverty as a problem. And I will show you more about this variation. Because look here. If I go back on this one, I go back here, and I, I pick in 1960, I pick Vietnam and United States. Tragic war was about to start between these two nations. And what has happened with health and wealth? Well, it's quite interesting. Eh? This is what happened. Today, in the bedroom, there are less children in Vietnam than United States. The, uh, the health situation is about like the early 90s, the late 80s in Vietnam today, the life expectancy. It's much better than it was in the United States when McCain came home from prison in Hanoi. And, and, and what is the big difference then? Well, the big difference is not in the bedroom or in the bathroom or in the kitchen. The difference is in the living room, in the garage, and in what sort of schools you can send your children to. And that costs money. We just heard the need for more allocation for research money. It's money. <laughs> so we put money here. Income in dollar, comparable dollar, purchasing power dollar per year. Vietnam is there today, 2,800. They're even close to the United States. You have to go back into history all the way to Lincoln to get the cor corresponding level. Isn't this enormous? Vietnam, in living room, garage, garden, and in school, they are on par with Lincoln. In, in, <clears throat> in, uh, in health, they are like one generation behind, and in the bedroom, they are on par with the U.S. This means that the world today, look, when I take all the countries out here, I deselect, you have poor, rich, you have sick and healthy. And you have Congo there, and you have Qatar and Singapore here. Norway is there. It's annoying for Sweden that Norway should be so much ahead. <laughs> Sweden is somewhere here in this group. You have countries all the way. You have countries all the way. And most countries are here somewhere in the middle. This is what Tom Friedman in New York Times called the flat world. You can see in the human dimension, Health, number of children, and also education now. The world is evening up much faster than it is in the money. What makes difference in the world is this. And this is what makes science, isn't it? It's the money. That's why the world perhaps is most difficult to understand from the point of view of basic science. Because basic science is so unevenly distributed still today in the world. Not the capacity of the people, but the possibility to do it. Eh? 
Huh? Let's go back and make a comparison here. Here we are, 1800. Everyone was poor and sick. And then they grow richer, and the West started to get rich first, and then with scientific achievement they got healthier. And when independence came, the rest of the world just went straight up like this. And then they went on like this. Let's compare US and China, huh? the two big ones. Huh? There was China, there was US. Huh? And, 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 and we take away the rest. This software is free of charge with all these databases. You can use it on the web, you can download it from GetMinders webpage. Huh? US got rich first and then they got healthy. China did the other way. They got healthy first. Here Mao Zedong died, Deng Xiaoping say, uh uh, let's be rich. <laughs> it's quite fascinating. Huh? That <clears throat> We see a human development. That's why this world comes as a, such a surprise, because we have the human progress before the economic progress. Whereas in the old West, we had the technology, the science, and, and, and the economic progress first, and then it transformed itself into health. Now it was the other way around. And it is faster to catch up today. It is indeed much faster to, 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 uh, to catch up. Now, are people understanding this? I had the possibility to do a survey of the knowledge of the world of the Swedish population a year ago. I could participate in a very well-performed random survey to, to, a, to a selection of the uh, Swedish population. I asked them, what is the literacy among 25, 20 years old in Tanzania? Is it 20, 40, 60 or 80 percent? How many babies are born per woman in Bangladesh? 5.5, 4, 3, or 2.5 babies. What is the life expectancy? How long do the Vietnamese live? 45, 55, 65, and 75 years. And people had a high response rate to this question, and they checked it. There were no joke. You know, they, uh, soci sociologists have good ways of doing this. And this is the right answer. Huh? The right answer is... 80% can read in Tanzania, 2.5 children here, and the Vietnamese live 75 years. And this is what the Swedes think. It's quite strange. It's only, what was it here? It was only 4%, 5%, and 6% of the Swedes who got the right answer. So I went to the zoo, we have a nice zoo here, and I asked the chimps there. It was 25% who had the right answer. I mean, Swedes score way below a random. <laughs> that means we are not facing ignorance. We are facing a preconceived idea that Tintin's world still exists. Banned Spielberg's film on Tintin. Because it's that, you know, wanting to remain in a colonialized world, this, this, this attitude of the West, eh, that they should remain here. And this is a big difference. They think it's four, and they think it's twice as many children per woman as here. Huh? They think they live 55 years. They take 20 way, years away from, from them. And, and it, to me, this is amazing that our education system, and I won't give you the results of the professors at the Karolinska Institute. <laughs> we have ethical rules in our university. <laughs> So, so uh, how does then the income distribution look like in the world? Well, you can look at income like this. You just take dollar per day for people. One, ten, or hundred dollar per day in purchasing power, not market exchange rate, because in some countries the, the money is much more worth. Huh? So, I ask all people in the world, come down, these are 10 years old data, but because these surveys are done with big intervals, and the income distribution in the year 2000 looked like this. Still the colonial hump, some countries here ahead of the others, and then the rest over here. Eh? A little more than $2 a day eh? was, was, was the, the, the most common uh, income there. And, and of the total amount of money in the world, you can see that the 20% richest, they got 74%, and the poorest 20% got 2%. But the most important is to realize that there are people all the way here. And let us see how the pattern of this distribution have changed. How the pattern of this distribution have changed. 
and, and I'll, go, I'll go here to do that. Um, this is Africa. This is OECD, as close as we can get to a definition of the West. Eh? This is Latin America, a green anaconda with all incomes you can think about. Eh? This is East Europe, the former Soviet uh, area. This is East Asia with China, and this is South Asia with India. And that was 2000. Now, we go back to when I was an exchange student in India. That was really rewarding. 1972, I studied public health at St. John's Medical College in India. And, and before starting the public health course, I did one, month, uh, one week in medicine. I just came from medicine at Uppsala, sat down in the same course there, and I made the discovery of my life during the first 30 minutes. Because you know, I was quite a nerd in school. I studied quite well. I was in the upper quarter of the courses. I got good scores. I studied hard. I came to Bangalore. I fell down. I was in the lower quarter. I remember in the x-ray, they showed an angiography of the kidney. Ah, that's a kidney uh, uh, hypernephroma. It's a cancer. I know it, but I won't say it. I let them talk first. And when they have spoken, the Indian students, I had nothing to add whatsoever. We read the thin textbook once, they read the thick textbook three times. We had better parties, they learned more. That's very, very clear, and that was already in the 70s, to see the seriousness of the students of my age in India, how much they learned and how seriously they studied. That was, I saw something coming there in Bangalore already in the 70s. And that has just became proof. This is what happened to the world. Can you see the population is growing and billions is getting over the poverty line. They slip backwards. In the year 2000, it was here. And if we, if we now slide it into the future, this is what happens. So on this logarithmic, this is projections from the World Bank. The hump is gone. See, mighty China is coming here, and the front of China is already down here. And they are getting away, more and more people getting away from the poverty line. So the world today has to be understood as, unfortunately and sadly, still more than one billion of our fellow human beings in deep poverty, not having food for the day. Extremely wealthy nations over here, and the majority in the middle. The majority in the middle. And, and, and let me, let me uh, give you some, some reflections of what this means. This is the poverty line. To me, it's very simple. I did food security research and studies on famine in Africa. My whole. It's when you go to bed hungry, when you are below poverty, poverty line. Uh, and and, and uh, this is the disease. I have the permission of the families to show this. This is the disease in the famine area, spastic paralysis of the legs that we studied turned out to be related to both malnutrition and toxic exposure of cyanide, dietary cyanide from, from the diet. Very rare disease. You haven't heard about it because it's toxic on nutrition. It doesn't transmit to the rich. Ebola you've heard a lot about because it can transmit to the rich. But toxic on nutrition diseases are no concern of the rich. They don't leave poverty. And, and uh, this young guy, he borrowed a shirt for the photo. He wanted that. Eh? We call it Konso. It's dominated by this bitter and toxic cassava root. The best solar energy supply system in the world is the cassava plant. It produces more dietary energy per hectare than any other plant. And, 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 but it's toxic. And we, we had this. So that's my, my way through chemistry. Uh, and and I've come to, I come to sort of have the privilege to, to have exchange with people in deep poverty. This ain't beautiful. These people carry their poverty with dignity, but they hate it. They hate it. They lose hours every day fetching water, eh? fetching firewood. Of what use is electricity? These women can tell. These women can tell. The number one they want is electricity. Give us a bulb. The best way of liberating young girls is to get electricity and one light bulb so that they can study at home in the evening. Build the power stations, supply electricity, the best way to fight it. Many have got this very, very wrong in the public debate about the environment. Eh? And, and I, I can show you what uh, economic growth is. 
Uh, this woman knows what economic growth is. She says, I love industrial revolution, the ball bearing. The ball bearing in the wheelbarrow of an African small-scale female farmer increased her productivity three times. One woman fetched water, the two other women can specialize in something else. Division of labor emerge. That's economic growth. And this is microcredit can help, a lot of things can, ha can help with this, but people want to get out of poverty. And this woman, which is part of our research in Malawi, she says, oh, sorry, it's an education in Swedish here. Out of poverty, it says there. Fattigdom. She thanks for the school. She thanks for health. The government paid the staff. The aid paid for the book and for the mosquito net. And we love the World Bank's credits to this tarred road. The infrastructure of the road, I can reach farther. I like my freedom and my rights. Because my husband is a good husband, but he's in town working to earn money for a house for us. Meanwhile, I have to have my rights defended here in the village. The microcredit for the bicycle was great. Eh? But I want to have a market for my product, or more than anything else, I want a job. Why don't anyone here invest in a textile factory? Eh? And information, the cell phone technology was great, and I have a dream. Give me electricity and fertilizer. That's what you mean. But these are the two things that the aid from the rich country never give poor women in Africa because they don't understand how important it is with electricity and fertilizer. So your mo molecular frontier have to explain that. Huh? I colored this very, very... If you are a little leftish, you li write left-wing policy, you have your stuff over there. If you are a little more liberal, you know, and market-oriented, you have your stuff on this side, you know. Uh, and, and, and it's when all these things come together, that's what creates a good society. That's what creates a good society. And, and here... Poverty line is very clear what it is. You need food, you need clothes, you need shelter, you need school. Those are the four things that poor people mention all over the world as the most important. And, 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 and ball bearing can be understood. I just want to promote the Swedish, um, not the invention of the ball bearing, but the improvement of the ball bearing is a Swedish thing. So Yi Gang is also an interesting person. Let's go to the middle of the income distribution. Yi Gang is head of SAFE, and surely people in China have, and at the top level, have humor. Because SAFE, the abbreviation, is for State Administrator of Foreign Exchange, the biggest SAFE in the world, with money. So he sits there and thinks, I have three trillion US dollars, what shall I do with them? <laughs> and they're quite, they're quite, uh, quite capable, the people who handle the money in China. I've had the privilege to lecture together with them. They're, they are quite capable, and they really think. Eh? So this is how it looks. The foreign exchange in, in China from Deng Xiaoping started here. Nothing happened in China. Can you see nothing happened, nothing happens, and then 95, 2000 happened, then the amount of money, this is the money. China sells their products, and they buy less. They sell more, they buy less, and the difference between that, it accumulates and it accumulated like this, and here they acquired the Volvo company, and all Swedes understood. These are the things that make sense. This is what you think if you look at a linear axis. I think this is one of the best education of linear and log you can have. On the linear axis, it looks as nothing happened for many years. Let's change it. And I'm, I'm the type of professor who can change inside a PowerPoint. I used to be able to do that. Let me see. I go there and show. I go to axis, it's a little terrifying to do this, rice mouse button, format axis, and you ask for logarithmic scale, you close and you go back. Completely, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> and students think that logarithmic is when you lie, logarithmic lie and linear is when it's the truth. <laughs> this is the truth. It just took one year for the market reform and the opening up of the Chinese economy, and they started to grow like this. But when you are very poor, you don't see it. Because the Chinese had such a low economic levels, you couldn't see it. The Chinese economy was down here. No one could see it. And when I keep growing, I'm growing, I'm growing, I'm growing, you don't see it until now you see the growth, isn't it? You know, and here you buy the Volvo company. Yeah? Then you understand it, you know. This is what is the problem, that, that there's so much hidden progress in the world today. So we don't, we don't even see it. Let me show you here. I have, I have a rice. I have a final here. 
time on this axis, 1800, 1900, 2000, and beyond. Money here. You see, I'm obsessed by money. We in public health, we love money because we know how to use it. There's no point in having money if you can't use it right. Eh? So, so, so you know how to invest it. $400 per person, 4,000, 40,000 logarithmic axis. We start here, and in my final, I have United Kingdom, 1,800 riches in the world. United States trying to catch up with the colonial master. Everyone wants to catch up with their colonial masters. Eh? That's what life is all about until you've done it. Eh? And, 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 and Sweden, Japan, and China was the same point. Sweden is just the Japan of Europe. Lot of pine forest and the king up north and they maintain the independence. Huh? <laughs> South Korea, Ethiopia, India, Brazil, Tanzania was down here in this group. How did the economy grow in these countries over the last, last uh, um, 200 years and plus? For those who come, wasn't that the principle of the academy here? And the academy did some crucial investments to help Sweden to rise. And this is what happened. Not much happened in the economy here it started. Can you see? When China goes down after the onslaught of the European powers and the Opium War, Sweden starts to lift a little ahead of Japan here. And the United States haven't catched up with UK less. The rest are down there. Then Sweden starts there, but Japan starts to follow. United States overtake United Kingdom. Huh? And Japan tried to follow, but the Second World War, they fall back. And then they come after that. And they, Sweden catched up with UK, Sweden catched up with US, Japan catch up here. And here comes Brazil, but they go into a dictatorship. Here comes South Korea. South Korea overtakes Brazil and China and India is coming. And down there, Ethiopia and Tanzania. Isn't that interesting? Huh? What you can see here is that the rate of catch-up of Sweden was slow. The catch-up rate of Japan was faster. It's exactly the same rate as, as uh, um, uh, South Korea. My first car was a Volvo, then I had a Toyota, now I have a Hyundai. <laughs> it's very straightforward, very easy. Huh? Uh, Brazil had the failure in politics. The last years it's going quite well, but not as fast as China, not as fast as India. And look here, Tanzania and Ethiopia. But they are down below. You don't really grasp it because they are coming, growing from there. So science still dominated up here. But look at all the people that are coming. And in number, just in number, the potential scientists, the capability, combination of intellectual capacity and fantasy that create scientists, we have a number, tenfold bigger number coming now that will get the possibility to study. And when will it happen? I've developed a stick method for projection. I do like this. And then I do like this. So I, can you see Lehman Brothers' footstep there? That's Lehman Brothers. These small crises has nothing to do with the future. They're small things. It's a wind. It's that these richest countries grow slower and slower. No one overtakes them, but everyone catch up sooner or later. And I've calculated that the catch-up of India and China will be 2048, the 27th of July. <laughs> it is my 100th birthday. <laughs> and I do this stupid precision to tell you the psychological importance of realizing it may happen in our lifetime. And it most probably will. I was at an investment conference, and one of the biggest investment conferences in, in, in Northern Europe. And I had lunch with three of the analysts from West Europe. They mentioned four reasons why China would fail. It was the energy, it was the democracy, it was the labor situation, it was the social tension, more or less like this. I had, I, I, I had a dinner with three Chinese analysts. They said, there are four big obstacles that China has to choose, solve. It was the same. It's just that their attitude was, we know them and we will solve them. We have to solve them. But the attitude of the Europeans is that these problems exist, so that's why they will fail. It's such a difficult... First, the population in the richest countries here, they don't know what has already happened. They're 25 years behind. And then they have the idea that the catch-up will never happen. 
it will. It's on its way. It's quite fast, in fact. And, and, and some have understood this. Some have understood this. I have to jump part of this presentation. So I'll go here. And uh, just to show you the numbers, what, what will happen. This is, this is back to my dolls, 100 millions in each. This is Europe, 15 years, 30 years, 45 years, 60 years. I told you it's boring, just a little less children, same amount in each age group. America is almost the same. Look at the dynamic situation in Africa. If Africa get two children per woman from tonight, they will still double their population from 1 billion to 2 billion. Because they have 400 million below 15. And 4 times 5 is 20, isn't it? And it will always remain 20. So, so they will be 2 billions. And so many can't understand it. Asia has stopped increasing the number of children. You heard the reason from the banker in Hong Kong. That, that most of the educa many educated women and more and more of educated women doesn't marry. And, and then they are still filling up the old person. So, so what will happen here is that, that uh, the old will die, then they grow up and they get their children. The old will die, they grow up and they get their children. And the old will die and they grow up and they get their children there. And then they grow, die and they grow up and they get their children down there. This is a very small part of the future world. The very small part of the future world. If Africa gets out of poverty fast and gets access to family planning across the nations and rights for women and, and, and men to choose, you may get fewer here. If you get gender equity in Asia, you will get a little more here. But otherwise, it's a very good business idea to rebuild schools to home for the elderly in Asia. You can see that that's an enormous opportunity if you would like to invest, you know. Uh, anyhow, that's the, that's the big fill-up. It's mainly a fill-up effect that, that we, are, we are looking at. A aging means quite little. It's an obsession of aging here. And these people think that that group, of course I want to belong to that one, so I can check up to 2048 what happens. But, but th this is a very minor thing, that this one, that, that's a very minor thing. Fill-up is the big thing. That is the really big thing. And, and uh, um, I, will, I will go back here and I will show you how really some has, some has understood this. Um, ah. It can be tricky on stage PowerPoint. Huh? Um, there we go. And I have to get... This is my world map. Eh? Healthy and sick, poor and rich, all the way from Congo to Qatar and Norway up here, Japan. Eh? Countries all the way. Eh? And, 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 and the best way to divide it is high income, middle income and low income. And I would like to stop here to honor, I honor everyone who understands this, but today someone who surprised me. On the 15th of November 2008, George W. Bush understood. And I like politicians who are going the wrong way like this, and they, oh, pop, pop, they say, and they turn around and they go the other way. You know, Gorbachev, de Klerk, and so on. And Bush did this to a certain extent, that fall. He had this headache called Lehman headache. It's a very severe headache. And he had no money. They said he needed money. So he went for the pocket, and it was empty. He had lowered the taxes to good years. So when none was needed, he didn't have any money. So what do you do when you have no money? You ask your friends. He you ask G7 here. And the Japanese here say, no, we don't have any money at all. Don't even think about it. We are in more debt than you are. So you have no money. Your friends have no money. You need new friends. So Bush took the telephone and he phoned the socialist Latino trade union leader and politely said, President Lula da Silva, does Brazil have any money? Yes, we have. We have been saving. We can lend you. But then we want to be in the board of the IMF. And, and, and yes, yes, Bush said, anything, just come here. So he invited all his new friends here. 
and they were called G20, and it was in Washington, and see how pussy, he put up all the continents, it became too many continents, but just as a, <laughs> a show of goodwill, <laughs> the goodwill was there, and he really, yeah, this is not a joke, I just, I just recognize, I think this, is the, the, this photo may be in the history books in the future, this may be in the history books in the future, huh? And Bush is standing here, he's happy, you know, and, and if, we, if, we, if we zoom in, we can see very interesting that he has a socialist here, and he's leaning, can you see here? <laughs> he's, like, he's like leaning this way. Here, President Jin Tao, uh, yes, the other president, China had two presidents, huh? <laughs> one is here with us, and this is, this is the other president. He's very serious, but it's like a little Mona Lisa smile, yeah? <laughs> I think you have a Mona Lisa as well. And also here, King Abdullah from Saudi Arabia has a moustache, so you can't see his smile there, you know. Eh? Here's Sarkovsky standing there, and Sarkovsky is saying, how come that France ended up between a Muslim and a Buddhist, you know? <laughs> it's the new world. It's the new world. And here, President Erdogan from Turkey, who had the fastest economic growth this year, is looking, looking, looking down at him. And here is Singh, you know, from, from, uh, from India and Mandevet. Uh, Merkel is just allowed to be there, you know, and the other ones are, 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 are outside. So, so this is the new world. How can we work this together? How can we do science in an even better way in the future together? Half the world economy is outside the OECD today. But 80% of the capital is still in the OECD. So we need to ship capital from the richest one-seventh of the world population out to the others. Be it aid, be it trade, be it investment, be it science funding, whatever. You know? Money has to go to where the skill and needs are. And this is, this is a very, very interesting world. And I wish you all well in this, with scientific collaboration, much more imaginative and much more creative than we have had in the past. Uh, Gapminder tried to add, uh, we have a free web page. We have a strategic uh, in, uh, foundation for free educational material. And we took the name from London Underground, Mind the Gap. We thought it was good. <laughs> uh, so all my softwares are free there. And uh, you can upgrade your worldview and don't think it's difficult. If Bush did it, you can do it. Thank you very much.